Hello, I'm Shannon Chiesi from The Diplomat, and I'm here today at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, where I'm pleased to join Dr. Michael Swain. Dr. Swain is a senior associate in the Asia program here at the Carnegie Endowment, and he is one of the foremost experts in China's security studies. Dr. Swain is going to be talking with us today about the U.S.-Japan alliance and its implications for China and the region. Thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. The latest news for the U.S.-Japan alliance is uh, Shinzo Abe's government's decision to reinterpret their constitution to allow for collective self-defense. And there's been a lot of um, talk and consternation about this. But what are the actual practical implications for what this means for Japan? Well, I think the main thing is that it's going to allow Japan to have more freedom uh, and to act more easily in uh, providing what's called rear area support for the United States, involving potential contingencies that could affect Japanese security. Uh, it's not going to be um, a sort of carte blanche for Japan to go off and uh, act militarily in uh, carrying out combat missions far from home um, through the UN and, and other things. Um, the way in which the reinterpretation has occurred indicates that Japan will remain very limited but have greater f freedom, greater flexibility, as I said, in providing support uh, to the United States, most likely it'll be the U.S., of course, um, as an ally, in issues that relate directly to Japanese security. So, so uh, it's, a, it's a kind of a constraining definition of collective self-defense, one that relates to Japanese security. Okay, so for an example, <coughs> if the Philippines were engaged in a conflict and the U.S. joined in, as it's obliged to do as an ally of the Philippines, would Japan also be able to join under those circumstances under the current interpretation of collective self-defense? My sense, my understanding is if you're saying join in as in a combat role, mm -hmm. the answer would be no. Um, if you're talking about providing, again, what's called rear area support, logistics support, um, some types of intelligence support, that kind of thing, that might be possible, although it's, it's a bit of a stretch to say that a conflict in the South China Sea is a direct threat to Japanese security. You see, the, the uh, LDP's um, ally, coalition partner, the Kometo, uh, was able to get this modification in the definition of what is collective self-defense such that it has to apply to contingencies that are clearly and directly related to Japanese security. That could involve a Taiwan contingency, would involve likely a North Korea contingency, would certainly involve a uh, Senkaku's contingency. I mean, that's not really a collective self-defense issue. That's a U.S., that's a Japanese uh, defense issue. Um, but, Thai, but the Philippines, South China Sea, that's a bit of a stretch. Now, China has been um, very wary of not only this move for collective self-defense, but other reinterpretations of the Japanese constitution. And they have said that this is um, Shinzo Abe returning Japan to its uh, militaristic imperialist past, uh, the specter of World War II re-emerging. How much of this do you think is a legitimate concern on the behalf of the Chinese government that Japan might attack China or in other way confront China? And how much of this is for maybe domestic purposes or diplomatic purposes? I don't think that this is a calculated argument that reflects a serious fear that Japan is going to replay World War II. Um, I, I don't think most intelligent, serious Chinese look at the situation in Japan today and believe that what we're dealing with here is a society that is very similar to the 1930s run by the military to a large extent with highly militaristic policies, territorial expansion, seizure of other people's territories, etc. Um, that is, to a great extent, propagandistic. Um, I think it, it connects to a certain element uh, within Chinese society that is very extreme in their views. I think as a government position, I don't think the government means that by its statements that seem to imply that sort of thing. What it means is that it sees Japan moving towards uh, developing military capabilities again without, however, having, uh, in a Chinese view, enough of a um, 
let's say, uh, enough of a clear view about what happened in the Second World War, about Japan's role in the Second World War. And that sends up all kinds of fears and concerns among the Chinese and the South Koreans and some others that military thinking in Japan could become more important. How important, to what ends, all of that, I think remain highly unclear in this, in this um, argument. Now, my own view is that it's, it's really unfortunate and counterproductive for the Chinese to make these references to Japanese militarism when they talk about Japan today because Japan is not the same as it was during the 1930s. You're not going to see that kind of a replay. It doesn't serve China's interest to argue as if you might see that kind of replay. It's in China's interest to try to have better relations with Japan. So on the one hand, you have Beijing's concerns about Japanese militarism. On the other hand, you have the U.S. pursuing its rebalance to the Asia Pacific, which involves in part getting its regional allies to play a more um, active role, to shoulder more of the burden, so to speak, for their own defense. Is there any way to reconcile these two, these two competing desires? Well, I think there is. Um, I think the U.S. policy has to be one in which uh, it defines its relationship with its allies as one that serves, to a certain extent, Chinese interests as well. And it does so by establishing some level of predictability and some level of restraint. Uh, restraint in what uh, allies might do and restraint in what the United States might do. Um, they're mainly interested in providing security for themselves uh, in their alliance relationships. Um, they're not interested in containing China, using the alliance as a way of confronting China and opposing anything that China might develop in terms of its military capabilities. I think the United States has unfortunately uh, developed too much in the direction of emphasizing the, the militaristic side of the alliances or the military side of the alliances and often the China-oriented side of the alliances. But if you have a strong relationship with the Chinese, if you show to them through words and actions that you're not trying to develop the alliance to contain them, and if you also try to get the Chinese to be restrained in the way they define these alliances and the way they interact with alliance members, um, I think you have the possibility of being able to balance those two elements. And despite the current tensions, <coughs> now you said before that you think the possibility of an actual military confrontation between China and the U.S.-Japan alliance is fairly low. How about the possibility of a sort of Cold War style conflict where we see regional countries forced to take sides more or less? Well, I think that is the long-term danger, uh, that we, uh, the Japanese and the Chinese and, and others, increasingly get locked into this security outlook, this security competition that becomes increasingly zero-sum in nature. Uh, that the two sides look at each other as one side gains, we lose. Uh, and, and that, I think, you know, is, would be an unfortunate outcome for this region in the long term because uh, there is no reason for the United States and China to be security competitors in a serious way in the Western Pacific. I think the United States and China have far more common interests in things that they have to address in this part of the world than they do uh, conflicting interests. And when we talk about this security competition, do you see this primarily as between China and the U.S., with Japan as sort of a proxy, or between China and Japan directly? I see it more between China and the United States. I mean, the security competition between the two countries really reflects a fundamental difference in how they look at um, their own military power and what role it plays in preserving prosperity and stability in the region. I mean, both countries want that as the long-term goal for the region. Neither country is out to drastically overturn the situation in the region, acquiring new territories, changing governments, that sort of thing. But you do have a very different view about the role of power in the two societies and the two countries. The United States believes that its position as the paramount maritime military power in the Western Pacific since the Second World War 
is the condition that allows the region to continue to grow and prosper. It's what allows people not to pour resources into arms races. It's what allows them to avoid some of the historical animosities that have existed in the region. So the United States has a strong commitment to its ability to be a superior military power, to prevail, to have freedom of action. China increasingly is acquiring the capability to call that capacity on the part of the U.S. into question for various reasons that have to do with the defense of its own maritime periphery, uh, the handling of very sensitive issues like Taiwan, the East China Sea, South China Sea, and, and so forth. Uh, the Chinese are acquiring capabilities that directly do undermine the capacity of the U.S. to act in, in the way it has traditionally in the Western Pacific. It's that specific type of competition, if you will, that stands at the center of the strategic issue between China and the United States. Well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. But thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Yeah, Swain. You're very welcome. And thank you for watching. Once again, <clears throat> I'm Shannon Tiazzi from The Diplomat.